<laughs> hey everyone, on time again. I like it. I like it when things run. Uh, with me, obviously, um, I always call you Paranormal Sarah, but Sarah Son- Sonderland? Soderland. 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 Soder- so? There's Soderland. There's no two O's. It's the little umlaut if you want to get serious, but uh, my American keyboard doesn't have such such no. foolery. So I, I can't even I can't even do it. So um hey, you have something from Elon Musk, Papa. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. News from Elon. <laughs> Tell you what I'm so uh, everybody's gonna uh, greatly enjoy this this presentation and I'm gonna scamoose and uh prepare for next hour. <laughs> I think I know what I'm doing, but I don't. So hang in there I'm, and just make sure, okay? I, I, I think you're going to be just fine. And break into a presentation once this weekend, and I don't want to do it again, but I will if I have to. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that won't happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll talk with you later. Okay, guys. I don't really know who's out there watching or who all is watching, but I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, It's going to be kind of fun for me. I usually really love to do live interactive chat like this. I love doing live presentations. I love speaking live, which maybe you have seen me at like a comic con or a dragon con. Sometimes I speak on things like spontaneous human combustion or the psychopathy of uh, criminals or villains in comic books, all sorts of weird, crazy, fun, parapsychological topics. For me, um, my background, and we're going to get into it because I'm going to introduce myself in a presentation. I told Michael and the and the people here at uh, the Para Unity that I am not the most technological person. I will tell you that. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Welcome. But I will give it my best shot. And with that, I have made a very special PowerPoint presentation where I just kind of want to walk you guys through, obviously what we're talking about today is creating a ghost in camera or ghosts as light or light energy as spirit energy. Title it what you will. I mean, it does have a formal title because I made a PowerPoint presentation, but it could be whatever title you want. Because I want to bring in um, topics of quantum parapsychology, uh, shameless plug for my book over there somewhere. And I also want to bring in topics of photography. I do own my own photography studio and I've been doing um, professional photography for a long time. And one of the things I like to do when I'm going to a paranormal investigation, whether it's somewhere in France in some ditch or it's in uh, old South Pittsburgh, Tennessee recently is where I was, um, or even Fort Snelling in Minnesota, where Ever you are, you're going to be somewhere where there is a cacophony of myth, lore, history, craziness. But in the present time, there is going to be light. And I like to always kind of ruffle feathers. I like to especially push the boundaries. I know in the paranormal investigative world nowadays, there is all sorts of equipment. There's lights, there's K2s, there's melmeters, there's spirit box, shack hacks, Estes methods. There's all sorts of things that people are doing to circumvent, replicate, add, maneuver, manipulate. I mean, go into whatever Shel Silverstein poem you would like to better understand energy. And light energy, we know a lot about it. We know basic stuff about light energy, right? We know stuff in the quantum realm. And I think when you talk about it in a philosophical space, you talk about it in a paranormal space, and you bring in some of those elements of photography with it. It's fun. And so for me, I like to go to a haunted location where everyone is setting up to take take the picture, capture the footage. The footage, right? That's what everybody wants. And to be able to walk up with my, I like a rebel, I'm a cannon girl, and uh, nothing big, nothing crazy, right? Size is not always what counts, guys. It's uh, what's in the camera. And I like to be able to go, holy cow, look what I caught. And you turn the camera around, right? We've not plugged it into a computer. There's no Photoshop. There's no phone. There's no apps. There's no uh, Linda Blair is spinning in the background. There's nothing like that. It's just your, just your camera. And there it is. A shadow figure, a shadow person, uh, a big ghoul or a monster or something kind of piercing through the background. And it's life changing. For some people, it is believing. Um, it is an adrenaline rush. It 
is a ripple through a crowd of people. It is the seance sister's wet dream, if you will. It works. Visual representation, visual perception, right? We all are very big visual learners uh, nowadays more than ever. And we need something to stop us. And that in camera is pretty darn cool. But it's also really easy to do. It's extremely easy to do if, like we say in the photography world, everyone's a photographer until you go into manual. Um, can you drive a stick shift? Yes, I can. Can you use the camera and manual? Yes, I can. These are, I think, really important goals for paranormal investigator, maybe not so much driving a stick shift, you know, RX-7 or something like that with a rotary engine, but being able to manipulate and understand a DSLR, um, a single lens, or just light, I think is really, really important. And so I'm always appreciative to be able to turn my camera around, show a ghost in camera, see the ripple of excitement. People go frolicking about. It's online. It's Twitter. It's viral. It's hot. And it's not real. It is real. I mean, I made it, but it's not real in the sense of what you want it to be. Great picture, nonetheless. I'm going to teach you how to make one. It's very easy. It's probably two slides worth of my presentation, but I promise you we're going to do it. And you can do it at home. You can do it at your next paranormal location, or you can come see me at a paranormal location. Uh, the next one on the books, thanks to COVID, um, is Savannah, Georgia, uh, this February, if you're down south. And I will be doing spirit photography there, which is creating a spirit based on the myth and lore and history of the location and bringing it to your portrait so that you've got a really, you know, good portrait there. Not a Sears portrait, not a background green screen, not an in-phone app, not a selfie, but a really good portrait with a ghost there at the haunted location for you to have as a sentimental keepsake. Because that is a lot of what we talk about in the paranormal is sentimental value integrity, that which haunts us, which is that which lingers. So what is it that you've seen that lingers in your mind? How would you create a ghost in camera? And what are some things that come to mind when just kind of openly debating the paranormal, talking about paranormal apologetics and light energy? And I just want to go through some of the basics with you. Now, guys, when I share the screen here, don't judge me. You're going to see whatever I have on my screen, which is a lot of things, but I'm also not going to be able to see the chat. So I am going to do the PowerPoint presentation and then I'm going to jump to the chat every now and then and hopefully I can do that. I think I will. I think I can let us uh, itch my eyebrow because apparently that's important and go there now. See, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid, Michael. I'm afraid. Um, oh, no. Don't look. Pretend that this you've not seen that yet. There it is. There's the beginning. Catching a ghost, light as energy. So that's me. That's my name. Um, it could be Paranormal Sarah. It could be Sarah Soderlund. Soderlund. I married a Swedish man. I'm actually Cherokee, uh, Irish, and Sinti gypsy. If you follow me at ParanormalSarah.com, you'll see all my adventures. And I talk about a lot of uh, spirituality and culture, things like that. The MA stands for Masters because I was getting my doctorate and I quit. Uh, I'm a quitter. No, I'm not. I'll finish eventually. And then uh, the CH is Certified Hypnotherapist because I do have to put that just simply because it is not for entertainment. I'm not doing past life regressions in groups at entertainment at a convention. Um, I'm not allowed to do that actually for licensure. It has to be for therapeutic clinical use. And so that's why that is there. So I do that for the Parapsychological Association and other ways that I mix and mingle my research. Hey, let's kill five birds with one stone, shall we? I'm a Virgo. So this is who I am. That is my name. And that is one of my first books I wrote. Well, my first book that uh, was published. So I've written a lot of books, not of them worthy of publishing. Uh, this one was, though, with Llewellyn. Love that publisher. It's actually housed here out of Minnesota, but it's a worldwide publisher. So I could go to Amazon or I could go to Barnes & Noble in my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, and run over to the bookstore and go over to the bookshelf and go, I know her, and really embarrass people that were with me. And I did. Um, Probably not so much anymore, though, because of COVID and Barnes & Noble dying and all those things. But also, the, the book is no longer in print because it was not a New York Times bestseller. It was extremely good. Uh, not the best, but I would recommend you get it. If there's any copies out there, it'll be uh, a relic, if you will. But over there on the right, if anybody cares, I always put this because I think it's really important, guys, that we know when we are watching or spending our time listening to someone, who the heck are they? 
where do they come from? What, where is their information coming from? You know, we used to have to go to a card catalog. We used to go to the library. We used to have to put this references, uh, work cited on the bottom. And gosh darn it, I still have to put work cited on the bottom of everything I do professionally. And I like to keep that standard to this field as well. So when I'm doing lectures or conferences or something, I say, hey, you may not care that I have a degree in Minnesota law enforcement, criminal justice, behavioral psychology, linguistics, interrogations, and a specialty for interviewing. You may not care. You may not care that uh, I have any any of that. You may not care what my dissertation is on psychopathy in America and that, you know, I've loved to travel the world and work with heinous serial killers and also underneath the Vatican differentiating between an extreme haunting like an exorcism would be worthy of versus something that's extreme like a schizophrenic violent of heinous crime. So these kinds of things of what I have spent my 10s, 20s and 30s and so forth. I'm a vampire. We won't discuss age. But I now own a photography studio in the northern woods of Minnesota. That's where you will find me. If you ventured to northern Minnesota for this wonderful conference and you are there relaxing by the pool, realizing that thanks to COVID, it is not a real live event anymore. It's next year now. Then you could drive down through Pequot, Brainerd Lakes area, and you would find Paranormal Sarah like a witch in the woods. Uh, and I own a photography studio there. And I travel all around the world uh, capturing people. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why that matters to you because aka paranormal sarah here at this paranormal convention we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of our eye because that matters a little bit a lens because you know those are present light as energy because that's the you know point and then we're going to talk about psychoanalysis of gestalt psychology so gestalt fear and projection this is kind of you know as light is leaving an object it's leaving the source uh, we are looking at the reflection so the process is like a six degrees separation of what we're even actually ever seeing, right? Uh, don't eat too many brownies and go down that wormhole, trust me. But what it is about is we need to question every step of that process. It's like a chain of command. We need to know who had it, where had it, who had it, hot potato, where did it come from and why? And once it enters through our retina, once it goes through those rods and cones and it's deciphered then it's flipped and it's done all this stuff and our brain interprets the neurotransmitters and these uh photosynthetic cells and everything happens psychoanalysis is going to take place gestalt psychology is taking place we're going to talk just briefly about that and if it interests you you contact me and we'll talk more about it because that's a whole nother lecture then i want to mention quantum theory why? Because, well, I wrote another book called Quantum Parapsychology. I did it with a physicist, and it's really fun. It talks about a lot of stuff that maybe, uh, I don't know, if you joined me on Booze and Booze with Nick Groff this past week, he was talking about quantum mechanics and some of the stuff he likes to do in his hobby time. And quantum theory is one of those things. Dimensions, if you watch Black Mirror or the OA or Carl Sagan fans, whoop, whoop, um, you want to consider light and dimensions and what it is we are observing and the fact that that is significant yes you are special um because observation theory tells us so um this little light of mine right we just turned that gospel hymn into a real scientific carl sagan song and it is real and then lastly what you came here for because you want to know next time you go to a paranormal space how to catch a ghost how to scare people right how to make people think twice right and also just have a cool sentimental uh, thing right? You don't need no, you don't need no app for that. You don't need no app for that. So really quickly, because I don't have a clock either. I'm just looking at my PowerPoint presentation. So we, who knows what time it is. Is seeing believing? I don't know. Is it? I'm originally from Missouri, the show me state. So you better show me. And that's why we call it the show me state is because back in the dueling times, it said, oh yeah, you better show me. And so the, the people would want to have that visual evidence. Now, even in a court of law, visual evidence is extremely important. Eyewitness testimony, extremely valuable. However, we also know that it's falsifiable. We also know that it's malleable. We also know that me, 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 it's not always accurate as far as what we want accuracy to be. Accuracy to be something that is replicated, something that's measurable, something that's, you know, consistent. And energy is not that. I mean, it is but it isn't. Ha! So 
I mean, into the quanta level. So up here in the big realm and the human realm and the realm that we are talking in right now, it's important we know our source. So this kind of means luminous versus non-luminous. This might seem really simple, but whenever you're going to a paranormal location and you're going to be taking any pictures at all, expecting to get any kind of footage or photograph, and then to expect to show it to anyone and, and allow it to hold up to any constructive criticism, you want to be aware of all the light sources in and around your environment. Some of them are going to be luminous, meaning they create their own light source, like the sun, like a star, like a light bulb. Um, yes, like a glow worms behind, or there's going to be non-luminous, which means it's just objects that are reflecting light and the more smooth and shiny and depending on what it's made out of, it will reflect more, less, or in strange ways, the light around it. So that's important. Just know the source like, hey, that's a car headlight. Oh, that's a reflection off the window coming off of their watch. Oh, those shadows I'm seeing, that's every time we move past the hallway over there. You're just, you're aware of your source. And I am I sometimes struggle in an investigation when people will often have that adrenaline response. Woo! And it's like, whoa, calm down. It, it's that. Didn't you see? Didn't you notice? It's like, oh, oh, man, I didn't even notice that. I wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> and it's like, well, come on now. Pay attention when you walk into the room, if you're there to investigate, obviously, if you're just there to have a good time, I don't care what you do, but if you're there to investigate, know your source. And then secondly, know your body. If you're not aware, if you're not assessing the space, if you haven't looked around every corner, then we do walk into a space with a kind of inconsistent uncertainty and that void of uh, alchemy is a whole nother lecture. We begin to demons, demons, demons. We begin to create monsters. So you need to know your body. You need to know if you've had a bunch of caffeine. You need to know if you've not taken your blood pressure medicine, you're diabetic and you've not had enough sugar. You need to know if you've been up all night. You need to know what you can trust between objects around you and your brain receiving that information. Do you have good eyes, bad eyes, astigmatism? Do you have heterochromia? Do you have, what do you have going on? Every single person, every body, everybody is different. We all have similar structures that have a similar process, but what we perceive is going to be different, largely based on our body and the awareness of our source. So this is kind of the boring stuff, but it's extremely important, uh, light as energy, because, gosh, you know, we think of light and sometimes I think of rainbow bright, you know, or you think of a laser beam like Ghostbusters coming out of a darn uh, proton pack. But light energy is an electromagnetic radiation. It moves in waves. Usually, that's an asterisk, right? A quantum mechanic asterisk. Usually it moves in straight waves. Usually, like a Pink Floyd album cover, um, light energy is moving in a straight line. And so we can measure it. We can predict it, of course, at a certain uh, double slit level. It does not do that. Um, and we also understand that it is a wave. It's a part of a frequency that is a full spectrum of energy. Light energy is only a small portion of that. And that any of the light given off by electrons in an object is what we're seeing. Visible light usually behaves in a certain way. And we kind of understand that. And this is something that, man, I don't see it happening. Again, I don't see this happening a lot on paranormal investigations. But just that, you know, did you know that you will likely see something before you hear a bump in the night. Now, why is that? Of course, because light travels faster than sound, right? When we're watching a lightning storm and you hear uh, the thunder, we're counting after we've seen the lightning, right? One comes before the other. Uh, light moves very, very quickly and we can measure the speed at which it moves and we do and we have, and that's how we measure things. <laughs> and I like it in uh, my husband, he's a music composer and he does scores for films and short things. And right now is that, that time of year, we're doing a lot of horror movies and projects in that realm, sci-fi. And I love watching a music composer and a movie director work hand in hand and be knowledgeable enough to know if we're talking about a spirit or a ghost acting as energy should act, then you would see it before you hear it. We tend to be trained the opposite. We tend to be conditioned uh, to 
have something happen as an audio and then turn and look in the entertainment industry when you're watching a show, uh, you know, like a great show, Kindred Spirits or something like that on television, usually you see the setup is, oh, did you hear that? Everyone turns and looks. And that's actually not the way in which things would have happened if we're assuming energy is manifesting uh, the way by which it is supposed to. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it do what it's supposed to? Well, if it was conscious or not. So we have a lot of these discussions about whether energy is residual or not, whether we think as a, an entity is an active haunting or not, whether it's just every night at three o'clock down the hallway and it's a Gettysburg battlefield and it's the old man, Thomas John, who haunts this land. And you see him every night at three and the same thing happens over and over and you can walk through the darn thing and it doesn't ever even seem to interact with you versus something that, you know, knock three times on a bed. You know, we're, we're there at this investigation trying to interact with it. This would not be residual. So at this point, we are assuming it's conscious, that it's it's responding as an equal and opposite, that it's making decisions to do something and not just reactionary to something we are doing. And that's really going to be important based on light. And we are only talking about visible light today, right? We're only talking about visible light spectrum because we're talking about just a basic camera. Now, you can go check out someone like Patrick Burns, who has taken some amazing and visible um, infrared invisible infrared images of like the Stanley Hotel and the Queen Mary and some really beautiful, uh, beautiful paranormal photography. If you are interested in such decorations, um, I think Christopher St. Booth also does some really cool, like low grade, high, high resolution photography uh, where we're bumping the exposure and things like that. We're playing with visible light. Now there's still all these other forms of frequencies in the spectrum that can absolutely manipulate the way in which we perceive visible light, keep that in mind. If there's a radio wave or an X wave or a gamma ray, or there's something, even a cell phone, right? Going off, everyone turn your cell phones off while we do our Estes session, because you don't want your K2 bleeping. You know, if you're standing between that and the camera, but by the way, great entertainment trick, uh, that someone has something in their pocket and that it's going off because these things can absolutely manipulate and influence and change what it is we see, what it is that's happening. And so this is something we want to keep in mind because Know your light, right? Some, I think all of us, we've played with light. We've seen the rainbow on the floor. We move our hand through glass. We've played with all of these very common ways in which light moves. Um, some of the behaviors, absorption. Yeah, objects don't uh, reflect or transmit uh, the visible light. They're not creating this thing. They're only reflecting the visible light that you're seeing. Absorption is an object that it's not reflecting anything. It's not transmitting anything. The absorption of it is, have you seen those like really cool science has done the, the black, they're like felt pen, like felt squares. You look into it and it's like, nothing is here. The nothing you can look forever. It's, it's absent of all light. Nothing reflects like a black hole, the black hole. And that absorption is 100%, right? And so we need to be aware of what is the absorption? of every surface in our environment, well, I mean, you can't possibly, I mean, you could, but just be aware of your absorption. What are you wearing? What absorption in your studio? If I'm working at the studio, what kind of background do I have? Is it a, is it a background light? Is it a textured tree or is it a smooth, you know, infinity wall? In the darkness, when we talk about the absorption of shadow people, which I'm going to touch on here in a second, this is, we would say, all light energy being absorbed. And yet that's not actually maybe what we are seeing. It could be not an absorption, but a blocking. And so how would we know the difference between a creature or entity? And typically people kind of jump to, it's demonic. It's like a black hole. It's a psychic vampire. It's sucking us all in. That it's an absorption thing, which is why shadow people are so dark and vacant and void of light. Um, I would maybe the challenge that it could be blocking, which we'll talk about in a second. But man, white objects, like near-death experience, it was a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, it's always angelic lights, right? It's always this really bright light coming. Oh my goodness. This is actually, or would be the reflection of all light energy, the reflection of all light energy. Now, if you're someone who's a very religious person, um, at ParanormalSarah.com, you'll see at the top I have a Gypsy Tribe link, so I teach the occult, and you can join the Gypsy Tribe, 
and we meet once a week and talk about actual alchemy and magic and spirituality and how to learn some of those things that like Michelle Bellinger is talking about and some of these amazing lectures when we talk about protection and shielding and blocking this would be like with light energy with energy in general spiritually too and white objects this near-death experience angelic reference thinking about reflection of all light energy think about there's kind of a reference to if you're clergy you're only serving and you know you're not getting allowed to marry you're not allowed to engage in sexual behaviors well, why why not well because that would be earth and water energy that would be yin energy that would be taking things in and having a level of introspection and empathy and a servant of God or someone working only in the light or which would be fire energy can only be in servitude they cannot do any introspection They're at the opposite end of that spectrum energy wise they're only giving what they have received from the divine and a closeness to the divine and so it is a reflection of all things rather than an absorption so there's actually a really cool reference to spiritual yin and yang and alchemy and spirituality with light and then maybe why we are seeing things as a darkness or a black entity why we see it as a white or angelic entity but also there's a psychoanalysis you know there as well when things are dark you there's an uncertainty you can't see anything when things are light you have it's come to the light it's like the illuminati right you know all the secrets um there's so many different expansions on this and that's why i love sacred geometries because it tells us that you can find it in something as simple as this presentation or something as complex as an experience you have at your next haunted endeavor and it will all come down to energy um what color you see my orbs are all green what does that mean um, well, if you know the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or that a witch would give you a green stone if you were struggling with a sore throat, or a red stone if you needed to get grounded, what kind of stone does it have to be? An emerald or a jasper? It doesn't matter as long as it's red. Why? Why? Because red light, we're talking that it's actually reflecting that wavelength so all other wavelengths are absorbed. It's balancing your chakras, which move and go up the spine in what red orange yellow green blue indigo violet and it corresponds to all the meridians in the body it corresponds to acupuncture acupressure holistic healing methods of how the central nervous system distributes energy throughout the body and it starts with the eyes it starts with how we perceive and just like this little presentation continued transmission integrity how light passes through something if it's scattered if it's reflected if it's absorbed all of this is happening times 20 in a single visual experience so to be able to see something an apparition of grandma and go it was grandma i know for sure um how do you know for sure we need to go down this list and double check what colors are we seeing and why has it been something that was scattered off of a reflective surface was it an absorption was there a shadow was there any refraction because when we see light reflecting off of consistent matter it will bend when it goes from one substance to another so when you see a straw in your glass of water there at the countertop you move around and at some point the straw will look broken it's an optical illusion this happens all the time it doesn't mean that your person is beheaded in the photo it could actually be a refraction of light in the lens it happens all the time it was also a really big trick in spirit photography in the mid 1900s so transparency blocking and opaqueness look at these darn pictures guys the first one is a shadow person now when I see a shadow person or when someone shows me a picture of a shadow person or when we're creating a shadow person the encounters and the eyewitness testimony I want to look and see if it has a, a shadow behind the shadow person what does that mean does that mean that the shadow person is actually made of a matter that's absorbing all of the light energy but would still therefore block any additional energy around it in the environment and therefore cast a shadow on the space behind that would tell me that it is something made of something on the electromagnetic spectrum that absorbs light energy and we begin to see where and what lives on those parts of the electromagnetic frequency spectrum but then you say oh well I don't see a shadow it's just a it's just like those things at Waverly when I was there with father Andrew Calder that time and we were doing a darn case and these things would move down the hallway and they had no shadow they weren't blocking light they were completely absorbing it so 
is it what they're completely made out of? Is it that they are a black hole sucking in everything and that there's no shadow and oh my gosh, they've got like this gravitational center and somehow yet we are still seeing a reflective of all light around them and that's giving a silhouette. Are we looking at a silhouette? What are we looking at exactly? And what do we know about the light sources in the environment? Being able to, gosh, we all know that paranormal investigating is a lot of deductive reasoning. It's a lot of deductive hypothesis and you can't recreate it. It happened one time. You got to be able to think fast. So I want you to look at some of these pictures or some of these moments in time in your mind. Try and think back. Did these shadow people, when you go back through your footage, do they have shadows? And if so, how is it being cast? What is going on? Now, this one here to the right, we were making these at the haunted Alton Springs uh, hotel in Alton, Illinois. It was flooded. It's been flooded numerous times, um, but there it's a very spooky location. And it's said to be haunted by the spirit of a young girl. It kind of looks like the grudge. So we got the opportunity to create that there just by opening a shutter. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that in a second. Let's keep on moving. Um, obviously, this is just a liability. Um, if you're paranormal investigating, if you are assessing somebody coming to you that's got like, oh my gosh, you're a paranormal person. <sighs> this thing happened to me and you're never going to believe it. And they bring you this thing because that's what we get is we get a lot of crazy stories, right? Um, we hate to ever question or criticize the vessel, the body, but we should. And it should be done in a professional way. Now, when I worked in social services for 20 some years, that is my specialty, being able to say, what is your sexual orientation? Tell me about your culture. Be able to maybe talk about hot topics that really are a big part of your identity and that are going to give me an open conversation to learning about you. Being able to say, hey, when was the last time you went to the eye doctor? Now, I'm not saying that because I don't believe you. I'm saying that because I do want to believe you. That's why you came to me. And so let us together deduce through all the possibilities. The very first thing, the light is going to come to, boom your eyes. How are your eyes? Was it dusty? What was the environment and the space between the object and your eyes? And then when that light hit your eyes, did you have glasses on? Were you wearing goggles? Were you wearing a hat? Were you wearing a shroud? Were you doing a ritual out in the jungle? What were you doing? Were you dancing naked by torchlight? Were you in the complete darkness of a basement somewhere? Was someone possibly standing in front of you? Um, did you have a clean lens? I Gosh, I know that these sound like really silly questions, but I've asked, did, did you clean your lens? And someone go, well, yeah. And I say, okay, when was the last time you calibrated your camera? What? When do I got to do that? You know, these are things we do. It's like maintenance. You also have to change the oil in your car. And by gosh, if you're walking around with a mask on, you should change the filter in your house, your air filter. You have one of those in your car too. And you can do it really easily. Just go buy a can and air filter it like your advanced auto parts. They're like eight bucks. Anyway, these are things to know. And we should do it with our camera equipment. We should do it with all of our paranormal equipment. We should do it with, thank you, Lord. We have eyelashes and pubic hair and hair and other places for blocking things getting into our orifices and eyelashes and glasses and things like this should be kept clean of all debris seems like common sense we we'll just cover it common issues though because here we are common sense with light spirits because that was a question like sarah are you talking about light entities fairies ghosts what are we talking about um well we're talking about all the things that are important to keep in mind when doing spirit photography because yes i do it like this photo here this is a famous international colombian dj's named julian uh, he's fantastic if you're into like raves and he does some kind of darker music and of course sought me out as someone in the paranormal that also does photography and portraits and we went to this really abandoned train yard with cool textures and had the opportunity to play with this um, scarf that his wife had and superimpose layers. So this was layering. This is three different photos layered on top of each other with him standing very still. And I love the idea of understanding that if light moves and we are watching something, even debris through the air, we're watching dust particles or breath, smoke, you look at something like ectoplasm and some of the very common old spirit photos and you know that their long exposure technique 
is going to lead to common things that actually look like this. It's weird. We don't see this anymore because so many of our, our technological cameras and devices and cell phones have auto. Auto! And it will do auto adjustment for light, ISO, things like this. But if you do have uh, underexposure or overexposure of light, you're going to start seeing streaming. You're going to start seeing things, moisture, uh, pollutants in the air, moving and manipulating what you see. Again, in the occult, like the Gypsy Tribe, I got the shameless plug for that monthly thing that I teach. Uh, air, which is why in tarot, swords is like, dun, dun, dun. air magic is, uh, is, what's the word I want to use? Tumultuous, pugnacious, if you will. It's easily manipulated. It's, it's crazy out there, air magic. So we have to understand air spirit energy. That's why people think that fairies are fickle. But orbs, smoke, mists, ectoplasm, streams, strobes, replicable, predictable. If we understand how light moves and how light works and how light reflects and refracts, then yeah, it is pretty predictable. And actually, it's pretty replicable too. And that's fun because you can use a spray bottle like this uh, in the top picture and create orbs what? I'm out in a cemetery. And you could be standing right next to a flag that's not moving and have your hair. I love it when the hair is drenched and laying down flat with a little bit of the same water bottle, get the hair wet so it's heavy. And then that way it, nothing is moving. And then you spray a little bit of uh, water in the air and take a picture, do it a few times, and you will start to see orbs and mists as light moves through the air. Uh, if you want to make it even crazier, do it in front of the headlights of your car. Hey, that happens all the time at a paranormal investigation. Everyone leave the headlights on while we investigate and trespass on this location. And then suddenly you're kicking up dust and you take a picture and from behind the light sources behind you and oh my God, look at all these demons. They're orbs. Um, when you see something that's spherical like this, it's very mathematical and, and geometrical, and we're looking at stuff, it's, it's how light is reflected and refracted, and we're seeing colors. We see it as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. We see the environment be red and purple, and then we start seeing blue orbs. Come on, guys. Come on. We need to be able to be smart and open because there's like Raffi uh, songs that we teach our children that's like primary colors, and you put those inks in your printer for the primary colors and those primary colors give us all the range of the rainbow that we see and when you look at an orb and then you look at the colors in the environment do deductive math and go this is a reflection or a refraction this is probably not an orb or a ball lighting and it's just us being skeptical but what about Sarah don't bring me down don't bring me down don't bring me down and I don't want to bring you down I don't want to say that Mother Teresa is not visiting you at night you know, or that Elvis Presley is not there um, singing you and serenading you on the toilet. My truth is that if we understand all of how light works and we start seeing and, and visualizing and capturing amazing apparitions, strobes, ball lighting, uh, and we can deduce that it's not the environment, it's not my lens, it's not the water bottle I brought last time, it is something that might actually be a spiritual phenomenon. Uh, maybe not even spiritual. It could be something even phenomenal in the world. We see, again, light is electromagnetic energy, light as energy. And so when you're seeing static, when you're seeing friction, when you're seeing sparks, ball lighting is uh, it links us to spontaneous human combustion theories, actually, if you want to go down that wormhole. But it's how manipulation of energy goes from kinetic potential to kinetic and, and we're taking friction, we're taking static, we're, we're talking about this electromagnetic spectrum of energy and how it's manifesting. And, and again, it does it in a certain way. The Mobius loop and that spectrum works in a certain way. And if we can watch the strobe and movement, we can measure the time, which by the way, if you're going to fake somebody, and this is just from one faker to another, from one David Copperfield to a David Blaine, if you're going to recreate this illusion, understand that you can usually go to a person's picture information on a file, on a data file, and that your camera is storing all the information, the date, the time, uh, how long it took for you to take that picture, your aperture, all of that is stored. And even on your cell phone, everybody be very careful if you've not checked your location settings. If you have an Apple device, it's probably automatically doing it every time it updates. But your pictures will post your latitude and longitude for GPS on your picture info. If you right click on data info, if you're at any amount of a basic hacker, 
any photo online that's uploaded from a device. You can find your way to the data and you can find exactly when and where that photo was taken and how. And you can even see what app and the owner of the app or the hacker or downloader of the app. Um, so don't try it. It's it's actually quite easy to do. And uh, for that reason, we should be careful what we share online. Um, all in the mind. So this is kind of where I like to really live. Uh, parapsychology and psychology is really all in the mind. Guys, we're talking about going into the minds of a serial killer, talking about why is it that you're seeing a demon? Why am I seeing my ex-boyfriend at the end of my bed every night? I don't know. You tell me. You know, it's like a Sigmund Freud thing. It's very important, and those in the occult community know that trusting your perception beyond anatomy, mind over matter, Dr. Strange, y'all, that you have to know how the physical world works, and then also when that information, that light energy comes through our wonderful body, our vessel, through the retina, through, again, those rods and cones, it's going through the back of our optic nerve and into our brain, and it comes in and we have a visual. We are going to, it's going to pass through gestalt laws of pregnance. Think of a pregnant woman, laws of pregnance. There's nine of them, I believe. They're very simple. You are already aware of them. If you stare down a lark hallway at the uh, Waverly Hills death tunnel and the bricks are all moving in a certain direction and you stare for a certain length of time, you will begin to see a throbbing. You'll begin to see movement just because of the continuous lines. When you're in art school, you learn laws of pregnance because this is the way the, the, the you know, connecting the dots. It's the simplest way that our mind will receive information. It's going to do it that way. It's Occam's razor. It's going to inevitably just do what is easiest and that's going to happen. Time and stress. Our bodies are on autopilot to save time and stress. But we might need to push that, take ourselves off autopilot. How do you do that? You've got to know how to change your perception of vessel. You have to be able to turn on and off your empathy, be able to actually shield and block and protect and ground. This stuff is how we, we go to that board, that big board in our spiritual mind, our hive mind. And we understand that by replicating and recording that everything that we've experienced in our life is molding and folding light as it goes into our brain and that our perception is going to be greatly conditioned just on who we are. We have to kind of be able to take ourselves out of that. We have to almost see in a spiritual periphery, if you will, and step out of yourself. You should always assess your perception and mental health for this reason. So this is why when I say pareidolia meets paranoia is often when people do come meet us, you know, in the paranormal needing help, they have captured something on camera, something scary. Oh my gosh, this was a picture at our wedding. And now I see this creature behind me and now I'm scared that we're haunted forever. And I have a negative attachment. Oh my God. You know, you see something and then you see it again, then you stare and now it's, now it's in your mind. Now you can't get it out now. Oh my God, is this an attachment? Is this a demon? Is this because I did that one thing? Oh, this is karma. Oh my gosh, this is because I ate all that chocolate. Nope, it's that stone I brought back from Waverly. It, you start going into your mind. And like with this picture here, I just used a DVD, pull it out of my DVD collection and held it sideways up to the lens. I love playing with reflections, um, being able to play with light. Assess what exactly is going on in your mind and what exactly is going on on the outside. Take a wide angle perspective, like this picture I took here on the beaches of Lake Superior. And assess your fear. Right now is October. We talk about shadow work in the witchy community. What is that exactly? Well, it's introspection of pre-suggestion to your viewing. What are you thinking about? You know, if you just got engaged, you're going to go out into the world and now everybody else is engaged. Oh my gosh, it's like everywhere I go. Absolutely. We have a learning channel and you are tuned in. If you like to listen to 95.3 The Buzz and that's your, your vibe, then you're going to notice other people that listen to that vibe too. You're going to notice the other people wearing that band shirt. You guys are going to click and gravitate towards each other because that's human attraction, laws of attraction, baby. That's how energy works. But that also means there's things we don't like, things that scare us. And that if we're walking into a place unsure, a place maybe trespassing, oh my gosh, we could get arrested. Ooh, it's dark. You know, Nick Groff and Schmack Schmackin said he saw a demon over there. You know, you could be stressed. 
you could be thinking about your dad in the hospital at home. You could be thinking about how you probably shouldn't be staying up this late because you have a test on Monday. And gosh, there's not a whole lot of lighting here. What can I see? I can't see a lot. It might be unsafe. You might be unprepared. You might not only be unprepared uh, physically, but spiritually and mentally. And does that have anything to do with the footage you're going to capture? abso freaking lootly It's like 60%. You've only got a part of that choo-choo train channel of information coming from the object to the reflective light into your eyes. It's going to go to your eyes. It's going to go to your brain. Then it's going to go through whatever's happening inside your body. And then you're going to speak something. And who knows what you're going to say? Is it even going to be relevant to what you saw? And then someone else is going to go, ooh, I saw that too. And then you guys are going to talk about it. This is like 12 degrees of separation. And are you haunted yet? Because what we think we thought we saw grows in our minds. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. I know that all too well working in forensic psychology, working suicide crisis de-escalation, understanding the paranormal because of a fascination of trying to understand abuse and domestic violence. Things haunt you because they linger in your mind and you can't get them out. So how do you get them out? Well, Things like counseling, things like showing other people, things like talking about it. It's the natural process, the Mobius loop and reciprocation of energy, quantum mechanics. Hey, look, we know that guy. That's Grant. Hey, Grant. Um, love this guy. And thank you for reading my book. He's given me a thumbs up. I swear I didn't pay him. Uh, I didn't actually. And uh, in that book, this, this is an old book, by the way. So it's even a, a day old would be outdated in the, in the world of quantum mechanics. Um, it talks a little bit about the double slit experiment. What does that mean? Well, it means that light usually always, we don't want to be a Sith, acts as a wave that goes in a straight line. It does this like a gun. You point it, it goes there, it shoots the target. Dun, dun, dun. A plus B equals C. But then we got so good in science that we could see all the way down to the quanta, all the way down to the teeniest, tiny, like how small or big is a soul, like that kind of space. And the little electrons, the little quanta, the little energy particles went, hey, hey, they're measuring us to see what we'll do. Hey, let's screw them around. Let's do what we want. And they did. Sometimes they acted as a wave. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they did this. Sometimes they did that. It started to really change how the scientific community views conscious decision-making, strategic multiverse dimensions, string theory, Mobius residual energies, the concept of playback, entanglement, um, just could we be haunting ourselves? Could we be envisioning or connecting with past versions of ourselves in this space? Man, all sorts of crazy wild things that all start with the things we are seeing. Why are we seeing it? Why did we see it then? Why did it show up now? These kinds of things are going to take you into quantum mechanics, and it's important. But again, it starts at what you see. And I hope that when you guys get to the point that you decide to go out with your camera, your cell phone, or whatever device you're using, a pinhole camera, to recreate, to relive, to be the ghost alive, which is what I love about spirit photography, right? That's what we're doing. We're trying to initiate that spook, keeping a ka, a legacy going, that we use some of our spirit to do that. When you capture someone's spirit like Zoolander, um, it's you're keeping a part of their soul forever, right? And being able to do that in a creative way that's true and authentic to the person. But I also think true and authentic to the location. You know, I don't want to just put on a mask and go, you know, goobly goggling through the tombstones. When we took this at the Alton Springs, there was a little girl spirit. But in this case, this is her sister haunting her. So it was her and her sister going on the trip and her sister got to play the ghost. But um, as you can see, it moves through the blocking of the shadow. It looks like there's people standing by and moving behind her. We had some really fun doing this, uh, a lot of fun doing this. And, and that's what's exciting about being able to create the photo or to even look at the photo and deduce what happened when the photo was taken is that we're doing time travel. We're doing it as we plan for a future vision and we're doing it constantly as in hindsight, we remember something and retrieve visual stimulus. And even in a physical space, again, sacred geometry is so beautiful. It's macro as is micro. The old techniques of photography, open shutters, um, needing to use what light you have because you don't have electricity. 
these guys out on the battlefield of Gettysburg did not have strobe lights and ring lights and their cell phones. They had to use what was available, what light sources were there, and their camera had to be very still. They had to be very still. And that meant that usually people are not smiling. Some of the best photos, meaning the ones that we kept and that were also sentimental and that have lasted, are the ones of dead people because they were a good subject. And it's true. I often thought with my early med school adventures, I would totally go into mortuary because they're easier to work with. And now I tell my people I like my clients dead or behind bars. And that's my preference. Um, just because. <laughs> but uh, I'm a psychologist and I work with people. Uh, anyway, the spirit photography is kind of this nod to you have someone standing behind you. You both are standing there for the photo. And you open that shutter, your shutter speed. This will be a manual thing, right? And you allow the shutter to stay open. The click, click is going to click, click. It's going to be longer. So you as the subject have to be very still. But then halfway through that shutter, you have someone step out of frame. Click, click, and then halfway through, say, okay, I need you to step out just after one second. So click, walk away, that, that, click. Okay, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see an old-time photo or a recreation of a photo where you could actually insert a spirit of someone you love. You could be down like at the left here at the haunted Belvoir winery, haunted inn where light seeps in and these things kind of creep in through um, the windows and come down through the ceiling. This woman felt like it was very angelic. She was channeling kind of an um, archangel Michael. And we opened that shutter and just let her sit at sundown. And as the light seeped in and she sat very still on the chase, it moved and burned through the image in its own color and in its own way. It creates a very beautiful image. Or if it's dark at night, a lot of us showing up at a paranormal investigation to a beautiful landscape, a beautiful old architectural historical building, set your camera down right? Because even breathing, even our heartbeat is enough to move a camera, enough to break the focus you need for Nigel Barker on top model. You need a tripod or you need to prop it up on something. It doesn't have to be a tripod. Just put it down. Put your shutter for 20 minutes. Maybe you can't go that long. That's going to give you the stars and the Milky Way and the moon moving across the sky, but maybe just two minutes, maybe five minutes. Give it as long as you can and see what it looks like when you prop it up in a dark night looking at that building. All the cracks and crevices of the stone, the Freemason signature on the side. It's like the Hobbit. Things come alive. You start to see keyholes. If you have enough time to set your camera down and let that shutter be open and it's at night, you can get some of the best pictures ever. And if you want to be fun, run through the, the, the lens, you know, at the last two seconds, it's open for five seconds and you, -do 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 -do, and you dart cross, you're going to see a darn figure running through the screen. You're going to have a ghost in your camera. It's all done with shutter speed. Whether it's like this, I'm crouched down outside. This is taken at 10 o'clock at night. This was my book. I wanted to have pictures of my book um, for promotional reasons. So I go out, I crouch down in the driveway, people. No light except a street light that's maybe 50 yards away. Very dark. You can't see anything. Your camera won't want to focus even on the details of the book, which is what was most important. You stay very still. Everyone stays very still. Tripod, put the camera down. Still, everybody still. Okay, good. Click. That shutter stays open. And man, you just shake your head, shake your hair, shake your face. You'll see a distorted face in there. That's pareidolia. If you stare too long, you'll start seeing witches and things. But you can also add a light source. Put your cell phone down. Put it underneath the crystal ball. Put a mirror down. Put uh, Take a compact if you're a woman or a man and have a darn mirror in your pocket. Pull it out and use that to add light. Your flashlight is on your cell phone. Your cell phone, also, you can download strobes. You can download background um, hues. But you can do just about anything. You can uh, hold a darn pantyhoe over your lens or take a piece of a Mountain Dew bottle that's sitting as trash in the back seat of your car, take a pocket knife, cut a corner of that thing off where you got a little piece of plastic, and just put it over your lens. Put it over half the lens. Give yourself a half and half and bring a concept to life. And you can do it all in camera 
by manipulating the light. So what I love here, this is standing right outside of the downtown of New Orleans. And we're there sitting, meditating on the sidewalk. And it was really fun because I had it stood up. I had my camera and I was there for a ghost tour. Um, and people are walking by going, what'd you get? Did you catch anything? And all I had to do was press the playback button. And there moments before my friend was shaken in front of the screen and you could see her face and everything. And people just freaked out. They wanted me to send it to them. They wanted a picture. They wanted to know how I did it. And it really is intriguing. It's not only entertaining, but it's a teaching lesson for people of any and all ages, which I think is fun if you're looking to kind of, you know, pep up your own time in a space that might be kind of boring. Or if you're at a conference and you want to add a little extra spice, these are all pictures taken in camera with the shutter. Closing your eyes, opening your eyes, closing your eyes, opening your eyes, putting really dark, even shiny eyeshadow on the back of your eyelids. If you don't have money or you're like my husband, you can't put those crazy contacts in your eyes because it makes you crazy. Just do some crazy eye makeup on the back of your eyelid, right? And then flip your eyes up and down. You will create something crazy. You can simply create a demonic figure or memorialize a paranormal investigation with a simple nod. And it's not just a nod, uh, pun to light. It is a nod to the evolution of death photography, understanding that when you saw ectoplasm or you saw those seances and people's faces were distorted, like in the Conjuring movies and the DVD covers, there's no creative license needed for this. Anybody and everybody can do it. You don't have to be a professional photographer like myself, but if you want to hire a professional photographer like myself, or you wanted to go to paranormalsarah.com to learn more about what I was yapping about, or you want to go troll me and look at my portfolio and see what I'm up to. Um, here's all of my online information and the two books that I referenced in this presentation down there at the bottom. You can find them on Amazon, uh, or I still have copies of my quantum parapsychology if you'd like a signed copy. I think those are on my website. Um, but they make a great gift. I also do gift certificates. And you guys, if you want a copy of this presentation, just email me all of my presentations. One's on psychopathy, neurolinguistics, um, advanced quantum mechanics, uh, anything in the occult. All that stuff, you know, education I feel should be free. Information should be free. So I think that is something we should consider doing and having and, um, you know, using at our discretion. And if you have something that you think could teach me a thing or two, I'd like to have it. And if you think that somebody you know or you want a copy of this presentation, let me know. I'll give it to you. Um, otherwise, guys, I hope that you will come and find me online. I hope that this is not the only time that we see each other. I do a podcast. I'm a writer. I'm a photographer. I'm a mother. But also um, at ParanormalSarah.com, the Gypsy Tribe is very near and dear to my heart. Being able to apply my forensic psychology field, my background, to what I, you know, can do in the in the paranormal. Uh, they meld really well together. So if anybody has any questions for me, we've got about three minutes remaining here, and then I'm going to jump off and hand it over. Um, I am going to be at the next Para, uh, para Unity. Are we going to still call it Para Unity? Yeah. In Minnesota next year, guys, in July, it's going to be perfect weather. This is my state that I live. So you guys could even drive through and get a studio session from me personally or a reading. I do psychic readings and divination. I'll teach you how to read a palm or two um, or maybe just explain a crazy orb photo that you have or have been given that you're trying to disprove. Anyway, you guys, if you're interested in replicating spirit stuff, if you're interested in learning more about quantum parapsychology, please check me out at ParanormalSarah.com. And as usual, um, thank you, Michael, to the staff of the ParaUnity Convention. Guys, this has been really fun, being able to bring you guys something during COVID that still allows us to network and learn and be entertained in a healthy way. We need healthy, good, positive, paranormal stuff. And the more, the better. So thank you, Michael, for providing this platform. And I do hope I will see all of you guys next July. I want to see you. I want to take your picture and wait and take your picture. And my homeboys want to, that's a rap song. I won't take you there. That's another lecture. But, uh, but yeah. So if anybody has any questions, I'm kind of, I'm looking at the chat. I'm now looking at the chat. As you can see, I can see the chat. Um, 
I'm really hoping you guys like the presentation. Uh, it, it's definitely better to look at than myself. And um, yeah, if you guys want a copy, don't hesitate to ask. And you guys, please enjoy the rest of the convention and catch up with me for this Halloween. Let me know what you're doing for, uh, for October 2020, end of the world. We're in this together, dumpster fire. Woo, 2020! <laughs> Right? Okay, guys, I'm going to hop off here because it's 2.45 on the dot. I'll talk with you guys later. Enjoy the rest of the convention, and thank you for joining me, Paranormal Sarah. You know, he says that I can now go to my booth, but I have a virtual booth. Um, I don't know.